our preacher for tonight, Reverend Stephen Handy. I've met him here this evening, and he already reminds me of my big brother. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> In just that time, I, my spirit just resonates that he is an humble man who serves as the lead pastor of McKendree United Methodist Church located in the heart of downtown Nashville and is a part of the Red River District. Stephen is not only a pastor, but he's a visionary strategist and a partnership collaborator of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He is a passionate communicator that desires to speak God's truth so people of different cultures, experiences, neighborhoods, and all of God's unique diversity can be reconciled through the unity in Jesus Christ. While serving as pastor at McKendry, he has transformed an inner city downtown congregation. He also led the congregation in a multi-site extension of the mission of McKendry, known as the Encounter. This is a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, and multi-class movement of faith building intentional communities of hope within the neighborhoods of Nashville. He shared with me that he is a PK. <laughs> but more than that, he pointed to that he is married to Shelley and they have three children. His go-to scripture is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. And so my sisters and brothers, when it comes to the preaching moment, we will hear from the Reverend Stephen Handy. Praise God. Amen. Good evening, holy, healthy, and happy people of God. Good evening. Good evening. By the way, in case you don't know, that's Wesleyan. I spent a whole lot of time and a whole lot of money in school and that's what I came out with. <laughs> to your beloved Bishop Taylor, who I just uh, adore, because she's a real bishop. Amen. To this strategy team, raise your hand in the air like you just don't care. Just. <laughs> God bless you all. And for my friend, Susan, who had the audacity to call me to do this, and I said, you don't know what you're doing. And then to Sandra, who introduced me with the words of God. Thank you, my friend. And then to the beloved community. Uh, I don't hold things well. Well, but they might hear you in the back better. Okay, this is not going to be good. <laughs> We're going to work on it. I use my hands, so I might just let that go. So let me try this. Can you hear me in the back now? Okay. So I'm going to do a few things today. I'm going to try to do a framing of this text that will cause some disruption. Can you say amen to disruption? Amen. In the reframing, though, there will be an enlightenment. Can't get amen. amen. So I'm going to tease you a little bit, and then you can push back on me. I'm going to tease you a little more, and you can push back on me. But at the end of the day, we're going to leave together. Amen? I am um, non traditional. So anything that um, messes with your head, I'm only doing this tonight. I won't be back tomorrow. <laughs> <coughs> Kirby John Caldwell, the pastor of Windsor Village in Houston, is a good friend of mine. Years ago, probably about 15 now, we were at a leadership conference, and he says, he's preaching about preaching. And I'm sitting there taking notes, and I said, Kirby John, I have a question. What happens if you don't preach well? You got no Kirby John. Kirby John looks at me and says, then don't preach long. <laughs> so 
so I'm not going to preach long. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh, glorious and righteous God, we give you thanks for this divine moment. Because we really don't have years, we don't have months, we don't have weeks, we don't even have days. We have the essence of this moment that is filled with a great deal of grace and the abundance of your love. We ask now for these moments with you that you would cause some disruption. That we would see differently, act differently, think differently, speak differently, all in your name. We're blessed to be here, to be above ground this day. We don't take it for granted. It is a gift. So throughout this evening, as we go back from this place into where we will ponder, let us see glimpses of your kingdom. That you would give us a hope that would not disappoint us. Now tuck me behind your cross. So no one gets confused about who's proclaiming the good news. This is never ever about us. Never has been about us. Never will be about us. This is all about you. Amen. The God of our salvation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As we would say together, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Just... So I have, I have three children, but the baby's out of the house now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we're empty nesters by technical terms. And my wife is agonizing. And I'm celebrating. <laughs> so the boys came home for Christmas break, and, and I said, how were your grades? In this age, they don't talk a lot. Fine. Well, I said, well, what, what does fine mean? I need some evidence that the investment that I am giving these two institutions will give me a sense of return on my investment. All right, bring it on. <laughs> and they look at me cross-eyed because no longer do I get their grades. The system is corrupt. <laughs> Pay the bills, I can't see the grades. And I got a note just the other day. The one who's at MTSU is in his second honor society and made the dean's list. I don't brag on my children. Sometimes I do. But I tell you that because I'm asking you a question tonight. Where is there evidence of your fruitfulness? It's a question I think the Methodist Church has to grapple with at all levels of our beloved church. Amen. And the challenge is we don't like tension. Wesley would say stay in the tension until you get revelation. Well, that's easier said than done, right? And so you have this text, and I'm going to conclude it at verse 8. Could you pull up the text one more time? I want us to read verse 8 again together. Verse 8. I know this was not planned, but verse 8. Together. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. Go back to the slides. John has a high level of Christology. He loves him some Jesus, y'all. <laughs> and he's always trying to get us to understand the dynamics and the personality, but more importantly, the teachings of Jesus. Right. So he's in, he baits us into this conversation with the text. And he says, by the way, let me frame this story for you so when you read it, you'll have it in your imagination. He says, by the way, I am the true vine. Ooh. Undoubtedly, there were some false vines. Ooh, okay. And then he says, by the way, my father is what? 
In other words, he's framing the order of what it means to produce good fruit. And then he reminds us, by the way, in case you think you're a vine, let me remind you, you are simply branches. I don't like that, Jesus. I want to be a vine every now and then. (laughs) That's not what he called me to be. And sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. Sometimes we get so heady, we think this is our church. This is not our church, y'all. This is the church of Jesus Christ. And by the way, I don't have members. Those are God's people. I did not create them. If I did, I would have done it differently. Amen? And so we are simply branches. And I think I need to be clear because sometimes we don't see the other branches because they're not shaped like us. They don't have the same color as we do. They don't live in the same geography or neighborhood or zip code. They're not dressed like us. They don't use our language because sometimes God's people are interculturally incompetent. I know I'm not going to get amen on that one. (laughs) Just want to make sure you're still here with me. And so if I am interculturally incompetent, I don't see you. But when I realize we are all made in the image and likeness of God, I not only see you, I not only see all the people, I want to engage all the people. And the challenge with our beloved church, let me be real with you tonight, this Methodist church of ours is 94% Anglo and 6% people of color. By the way, that's based on the Pew study of 2018. That's the same number that was existing in 1968. 50 years, we have not changed the complexity or complexion of our beloved denomination. I got issues with that, y'all. When the country is 65% Anglo and 35% people of color, we got work to do. We got to pay attention to the branches. There must be some evidence. We need an exhibit A and an exhibit B to do this work. Next slide. I said I wasn't going to preach tonight, but I'm sorry. (laughs) Go next slide. So remember, producing fruit is like making disciples. There must be a clearly defined system. We are Wesleyans. We are systematic people. We know how to do this work. And we got non-denominational people, Southern Baptist folk, Roman Catholic folk, taking our stuff. Reimagining it and saying, look what we did, and they're growing by leaps and bounds. And in a church, right, that says it wants to be discipled by Jesus, all of a sudden we're on mute. Because we're not clear what it means to be a disciple because none of us have ever existed in a growing movement in the Methodist church. It was before any of us were born. We have grown by merger. Don't get quiet on me now. (laughs) And so this idea of growth is a fascination. We've never been there. And so we, con- we want to argue we did not lose that many people last year. So we celebrate a reduction in loss. Does anybody besides me think that's crazy? At what point do we realize there are enough people in our network that don't know Jesus? And if we're faithful and bold enough to step into the unknown God will meet us there. Does the church have a discipleship-making system? And can we reproduce it? I'm in a district that has 100 churches. We surveyed our churches in the Red River District, and we found 10% of them that have discipleship-making systems. I said that's a great opportunity. 
the other 90%, we can help. But we've got to be willing to see them. Next slide. Jesus is already active in the neighborhood. Praise the Lord. We don't have to do this work on our own. Can I get an amen? You see, Jesus is already up to something, and I want the DSs to know in the house, don't try to fix people. One model doesn't work for everybody. It has to be contextual. So my DSs, who I love, here, here. <laughs> Dr. Adam Black's a good friend of mine. Adapt. And then once you adapt, unlearn. Because you're in an environment that no longer does that work, and so stop trying to force it. Amen. We need a new set of eyes. We need a new heart. We need new hands. We need new feet. We need new perspective. And so if you want that, you've got to go in the marketplace and have coffee with people you don't know. Amen. And who will disagree with you. That's how you grow. Lord have mercy. Amen. So one of our core values at McKendry, McKendry's 231 years young this year. With the oldest Methodist church in the Tennessee conference, Mother Methodism, right? So I used to tell my church, hey, we should say, God's church, if you say, you know what, we're the oldest church. I said, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> who wants to go to the oldest church? I said, tell them we're an historic church that's still history making. And so one of our core values, and it's a stretch, and I have great dialogue with my clergy friends, our core value is discipleship and diversity. Let me open it up just a little bit. We don't settle for who's there. We are not content about who's in our neighborhood. We ask the question every week, who's missing? I dare you to start asking that question around the cabinet table, around the DS's table, around church level leadership tables, around your community tables. Who's missing? I celebrate who shows up for worship on Sunday morning, but I am disgruntled about who's missing from this beloved table because there's so many people who need the love and support and faithfulness and righteousness of the one who saved us. Amen. And once they get a glimpse of the kingdom through this guy named Jesus, it's over, y'all. The kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. So stop trying to get folk into heaven when heaven's trying to get on earth. I didn't mean to say that. Don't you say that in front of people. So discipleship is relational. Here's an assignment. When you go back home, Find five people in the next two weeks that you don't know and invite them into a conversation. So I usually carry five marbles with me every week. And those five marbles I take on Monday morning and I go meet somebody I don't know. I spend the majority of my time in coffee shops. Why? Because there are more people in coffee shops than in the church. Amen. And so I go and every time I meet somebody I'll say, um, Hugh, I don't know you, but I want to let you know that this marble, just pretend I'm giving you a marble, okay? Hugh, thank you. This marble is a, a representative, an understanding that you have made in the image and likeness of God. Have a great day. I can't go home until I get rid of all five of those marbles. Can you imagine if our church didn't go home? Lord have mercy, didn't go home until they gave their five marbles away every day. Stop smiling. So this relationship thing is real. It means that we cannot be normal anymore. We have to be abnormal. Next slide, please. So things at McKendry is we have this intentional discipleship process, and it starts with connect. We connect with God first. But we don't do anything until we pray for a season. We believe that the Holy Spirit will guide all of our acts and all of our actions and all of our words. And so we don't move until the Spirit says move. <laughs> Can you imagine if we did that as a church? Then we wouldn't move until the Spirit said move. So we connect with God. We connect with neighbor. 
Then we equip them for ministry. The scripture says that we're here what? We equip the saints for ministry. And then the last one is we send people out. And then on Sunday morning, sometimes we'll have just a session where people are saying, let me tell you who we met this week. Can you imagine a worship service talking about people who you met? You're talking about giving honor to God. God wants us to know those who are invisible. Those who are what? Invisible. Detached. Those who are what? <clears throat> Detached from the love of Jesus. Next slide. So part of this is a process, and I want you to write this down, because I didn't get my slide on the thumb drive, y'all. I was, I was slow. So the first one is listening. And here's what I've learned about listening. Uh, most of us have never taken a listening class. We get applauded for speaking. And so if I don't know you, chances are I won't listen to you. But we've been framed with two ears and one mouth. Amen. And we talk twice as much as we listen. So at what point in time do I believe you're valuable enough that I won't stop you, that I won't put my words in your mouth, I'll let you finish your statement. And I'll spend a season not only listening to God, but listening to God's people who are in the marketplace and they need Jesus. And by the way, I need more of Jesus today than I did yesterday. Amen. The next one is discerning. You got to spend enough time in quiet time to hear what God is saying. You listen, then you hear. My wife often tells me, you're listening, but you don't hear me. <laughs> and I can, I can do about five minutes, y'all. Five minutes of my wife talking. And then she'll say, are you listening? What did I just say? Um, so I ask my wife often, do you want me to listen or do you want me to fix it? And she said, I just simply want you to listen. And I'm trying to fix it. Church, God wants us to listen. God doesn't want us to fix it. Junior's, Junior's Dobson will say, stop trying to fix the church. It's going to always be broken because we're people. Then the next one is testing experimentation. I'm going to talk about this a little later. What are you experimenting with? The church should be experimenting all the time, learning something new and different and sharing it with others. It shouldn't become so stale and productive. Worship should never be predictable. I mean, could you hear that hush in the room? I can feel it. You can feel it. Thank you. So what I mean by that is worship should not be so predictable that you check off the things on the bulletin. <coughs> shouldn't there be a mystery about worship? And worship, I contend, and we can debate this later, is not about us. It's our offering to God, and it's for those who are coming. We've designed for worship to be for those of us who look like us, smell like us, dress like us, yada, 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 right? And that's not for worship. Worship is for those people who are coming. If you spend time in the marketplace to get to know, they want to go where you go. So experimentation is fun. They're reflecting. Now that you've experimented, what does it mean? What does it mean to the people of God? And then last, deciding. What are you going to do differently? Next slide. So this is a book that that comes from. I advise you. It's a short read of about 95 pages. I give it to my friends. Please get a copy of this book. One of the fascinating questions of this book, next slide, and I'll get it to you, is this statement right here. Unless we know our culture, the strategies are useless. So what we're trying to do is strategize ourselves into a new church. <coughs> the way forward. God says if you understand the culture, you find strategies that speak to the culture. And if those strategies are the right, the culture will be transformed. Next slide. So we are creating a culture of experimentation, collaboration, innovation, and ultimately discipleship. If we're not doing discipleship, I don't know what we're doing. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I can draw a crowd on Sunday. Jesus didn't call us to draw a crowd. He says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Now, if you don't do that, chances are you're not going to produce any fruit. Next slide. So we got some missional partners. And in our missional partners, we believe we have to align with them because they're in the marketplace. 
And one is called the 313. It's a co-working space from a 24-year-old who graduated from Belmont. He's an entrepreneur. And he has said, Pastor Stephen, I named it 313 because the church has 365 days of operating, and they typically operate on Sunday only. So he subtracted the 52 from 365. So his company's named 313. As we're sitting there talking, did you say uh huh? Okay. So he's sitting there talking to me. He says, Pastor Stephen, I believe God has called me to help churches use their space for community. So I'm sitting there with this 24 year old who has capital. Amen for capital. <laughs> And he says, I want McKendra to be a prototype so I can show other churches that this can be done in their churches. Did I say he had capital? <laughs> and I said to Brennan, I said, Brennan, come tell me what you see. He's going to take our fourth floor and our fifth floor, which is a loft overlooking the city. He's going to invest about $85,000. Anybody got $85,000 here? And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're not talking about just the structure. You're talking about creating new space for new people. I believe God wants our church to reflect these three things, not one of them, but all three. We need more people. We need more young people. We need more diverse people. Amen. So if our churches don't reflect that, why would we think there's fruitfulness? Don't get mad at me. I'm only here for a season. But at the end of the day, if our churches don't look like the kingdom of God, then what do they look like? <coughs> okay, next slide. No, let me go back. Let me go back. Um, Harding, Monroe Harding. Uh, we had this third floor um, of classroom space. And we had our senior members, 10 of them, met there for 30 years. <laughs> and one day I had the, the bright idea to go up and tell them I think they needed to move. No, it didn't, it didn't end pretty. <laughs> and I said, what if we could bring some young adults in here and build some relationship with, because these young adults have aged out of foster care. Think about it, where we're going. This is unusual, this is non-traditional. And nine of them said, yes, we're in. Mr. Grumpy said, no, <laughs> this is our room. So I said, okay. Why don't you go home and pray about it? So he calls me Monday, says, we want our classroom back. I said, well, last time I checked, this is not our church. He says, well, we're going to stay there until you move us out. Hmm, really? And you say you love Jesus. Next week, he calls me. He says, you know what? I've been praying about it. And I think it's a good idea to have those young adults in that space. I said, that is a brilliant idea. Where did you get that from? <laughs> and so for five years, we have about 60 young adults in our space. We do mentoring and coaching, do their graduation ceremonies there. We're building some deep abiding relationships. Why? Because we met them where they were. Number three, Healing Arts Project is another kind of therapeutic issue around people who have mental disorder, and they've realized that art is very therapeutic for them, and so we just signed them up about three months ago, and they're bringing about 12 people into our facility. We have said that our facility is not for us. If we don't have missional partners, missional activity going in our building, then we need to close it. I am sitting on $24 million in downtown Nashville. We could do a whole lot of things, right, Alan, with $24 million. But we're not going anywhere because God has not said it's time to leave yet. Then we have a counseling center that we give free counseling to those who need it. <gasps> Did I say free? That's my second favorite word. The first one is love. The second one is free. <laughs> Restoration Point is our nonprofit. There are 3,000 homeless people in downtown Nashville, and they're trying to kick them out. We have said no. We've taken our facility that used to be room in the inn, and we have said, let's reimagine that space. It is called the Foundry. 
Can I get an amen, Methodist? We do job training, job placement, financial planning, up to eight men. We graduated three into affordable housing last month. We're doing our part. Can you imagine that every church in Nashville, there's 700 in Davidson County, where half of them were to take their space and say, we want our friends to be a part of this. Not our homeless friends, but our friends. Then number, number four, well, number five, we just started a community alliance because we can't do all the work by ourselves and we don't need to do it in isolation. So I'm gonna give you a few pictures. This is, th this is 313. This was a church that Brennan took and he started to do this work and right now he's at 95% capacity in three months. Wow. It's amazing. So if you wanna get in contact with Brennan, just let me know before I go. Next slide. This is the foundry. They did new flooring, they did new countertops, they cleaned the restrooms, they added new um, furniture. They spent $30,000, our neighbors in the 505 building, $30,000 of furniture and free labor because they heard that we wanted to help our neighbors. We house up to eight men in this facility. We could be selfish and say it's ours. The church is not ours. The space is not ours. Next slide, please. That's their bedding. Let's say this together. The church must balance It's hard. Right? But God says, if you're not producing fruit, then what are you producing? Next slide. This is our community meal, part of our restoration point. We serve 125 every Tuesday with a worship service. We do a full pledge worship service with communion. And one of them came up and hugged me um, last, last Tuesday, and he said, Pastor Stephen, we don't know why you do this, but we're glad you do. So because I'm, a, I'm an extrovert, <laughs> I said, can I talk to you about a relationship with Jesus? Just one thing to feed folk. It's another thing to sit at the table and eat with folk. Right. When they are not. <laughs> Watch your path. God will always put people in your path to disrupt you. So I think, and this is just me, I think we get to hold everybody accountable for discipleship. I think every year we bring people in the room and we say, how many people have you discipled and how many people are discipling you? From the bishops to our children's ministry. Simply just want to know. Why? Because that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't do this work to count numbers, although we do. <laughs> and we should. But we do this work because we've been saved by... We've been saved by... Grace. Through... Faith. Why do we do this work? We've been saved by... Grace. Through... Faith. Why do we do this work? We've been saved by... Grace. Through... Why do we do this work? We've been saved by through. So act like it. <laughs> Wake up every morning. You can't wait to jump out of the bed and report to duty. God, what would you have me to do today? Who would you have me to love? Who would you have me to help? A whole lot of folk in your network. It's called a web. Pay attention to it. You can put the blinders on. You can put your head down. We're going to miss them. They're waiting on connection. People want to belong even before they have to believe. But if they belong, we can get them to understand how important belief is. Next slide. So this is one of my favorite parts. This is our experiment that happened at the United Methodist Publishing House. <laughs> they gave us free space. I love free. <laughs> so we said in this zip code called 37208, 
It is the most incarcerated zip code in America. Wow. And it's in Nashville. And nobody knows about it. And that upsets me. But I'll get over myself. So we said, what would happen if we planted a fresh expressions? And so here's what we did. We went back into history and we looked at the first century church. That's a marvel idea, is to look back at your history. And we said first century church met around tables and chairs. So I can look at you around a table or I can look at you the back of your head. <laughs> Constantine shifted the focus of communal gathering into this pew and pulpit. Now, you don't have to believe me. Just read the history. That's when Christianity started to take a nosedive. It was still growing, but it wasn't growing at the rate that it was as we left the table. Amen. So we're trying to reclaim the table. Next slide. So go, go back. When, when um, he showed up with sandals and, us and shorts, I said, Lord have mercy, what is the world coming to? And then I had to realize I have to be adaptive. If you're going to be here, you're going to offer your gifts to God, come as you are. Next slide. So we ran our tables and chairs, and it's a cool venue. I think you all would love it. Next slide. Say this with me. Branches are what? Connected. Okay, trust the person on your left or your right. Say, branches are? Connected and diverse. One more time, the other person. Branches are? And then lift up to God. See, take a smile. Take a picture. Take a picture. Say, branches are? Connected Who are your closest friends? Your five closest friends. Write their names down right now. Your five closest friends. Your five closest friends. Write it down, please. Five closest friends. As you're writing them down, are they diverse by age, by color, race, by creed, by zip code? by church affiliation, by political views, are they much like you? Next slide. In order to produce fruit, we must learn to ask non-church questions. Well, well. I grew up asking church questions. Most of the people I know in the Methodist church are always asking church questions. When do we start to ask community questions that will impact the church? So we started, next slide, we started asking questions about this school called Buena Vista that is the lowest performing school in the state in the same zip code as the most mass incarcerated zip code. A street over is a housing project. A street over is Germantown, where three years ago, they sold a million-dollar home. We said no more, not on our watch, because we believe that worship should move you to a sense of justice. And we need to figure out a theology, Bishop, of suffering and not just a theology of celebration. Beer would say that y'all wouldn't say much of that anyway, so we're going to move on. <laughs> we are hopefully, if Alan Black can help me, we're trying to get this property for this church that closed about two years ago to start an all-boys school. Wow. Did Wesley start schools? Yes. When is the last time the Methodist church started a school? So we're trying to disrupt mass incarceration by having impact. And we don't know what we're doing, but we believe that if we set the table, that God will send the right people to the table to get this work done. Amen? Amen. Next slide. This is the parsonage. 
Next slide. So the Cumberland is the 25-story building next to us. And we've been trying to figure out how to get into high rises. Difficult downtown. The days of going knocking on the door and saying we're here are over. So we've been praying and God sent us this 75-year-old whippersnapper. <laughs> See, I'm Southern Baptist, but I'm going to try Methodist. Because the Southern Baptist church was too far to walk. <laughs> She comes to our church. She's been there two years. Last week, she invited me to start a Bible study in this space. Wow. That's nothing but God. Amen. I'm not that smart. <laughs> By the way, you're not that smart either. <laughs> but if we trust God to do and make the connections, then great things will happen. Next slide. So part of our work is around health care. <laughs> Because we believe there are 700,000 people in the state of Tennessee that need more health care or health care, period. It is not political. It is moral. That's right. So the church gets to participate because Jesus says, render unto Caesars what is Caesars and unto God what is God's. So who doesn't deserve health care? So part of this was... So, Asian, white female, biracial, white female, African American, African American. What if we multiply that by 200 and we had a church? So here's where McKendry's trying to go. We're trying to move away from just a vanilla or chocolate church. <laughs> We're trying to create a Baskin Robin church. <laughs> and here's what disgusts me. We're satisfied with vanilla or chocolate. At every level of our church. Those days are over. As for me and my house, what will we do? We will serve the Lord. Next slide. So we have an annual picnic that happens in the city, not downtown Nashville, but in the city. And we ask our members to invite someone who's never been to church. And we can't hold them. And the only thing we do is we offer them food and something to drink. And then we say, if you want to know more, give us your telephone number, your email address, and we will reconnect. We don't beat them over the head with scripture because we know that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We beat them over the head with love. Mm -hmm. And love does work, amen? Yeah. Okay, next slide. So we do these community engagement events about quarterly, and it's usually around subject matter that is intense in our community. So we did something on the movie called The Twelfth. And it was around imprisonment, and we had 250 people show up at this event from all seven counties of Middle Tennessee. Did I tell you we're not that smart? Did I remind you that you're not that smart either? And we do this, why? Because the gospel is compelling. And the gospel will do things that we never thought we could do. So I want to offer you this. Verse 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. I grew up with a game called I Dare You. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Yes. And I came out of the urban core, so we took it to another level. We said I double dare you. And then for some strange reason, we took it to another level, and we said, I triple dare you. You are beloved leaders of the church. The only thing that can stop you from the kingdom coming on earth is you. Amen. So I dare you to multiply this room in six months. I double dare you to triple this room in a year. 
Why? Because leaders like you know people who know Jesus and don't know Jesus. So let's shake the foundations of the earth. Let's let people know that Methodists are vital, alive, and well, and this game is over because Jesus said it is finished. This is our time under God. I dare you. I dare you. I dare you. I double dare you. I triple, quadruple dare you to find someone who doesn't know Jesus and share it and stop being so routine and ritual that it's not changing anything. Reimagine it. God is a God of inclusiveness and diversity. Amen. And he wants to bring the kingdom on earth. Now, our beloved church has so much more to offer. I don't know where you are on our future, but the Sunday after special general conference, we're going to gather and worship. Amen. We're going to talk about Jesus. Amen. We're going to make disciples. Amen. We're going to go to places that people say we can't go. We're going to befriend folk who the world, the culture said, we don't belong together. We're going to break bread. We're going to have a cup. And we're going to say this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, church. Amen. Amen.